fine okay right hello hello professor dorothy sheridan MB. Well, thank you <laughs> courage <laughs> Thank you very much, Dorothy, for agreeing to have a chat today. And it's really lovely for me to have the opportunity to talk to you because we've worked together for so many years. Yeah. Um, and, and I really miss having chats with you all the time and, you know, having another mass observation nut to chat to about MO, but just generally as well, because uh, you've always been a huge inspiration and a mentor and a wonderful friend. Um, so... Yes, the pleasure is all mine to be able to talk to you today. Um, but this is all about getting to know you and get, getting to know you and you and mass observation and how, how that's intertwined over the years. So how long is it that you worked with mass observation for? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question, Fiona, because I did the maths. <laughs> did you? <laughs> well, if and you, if you count from my very first interview with Tom Harrison, which was in 1974 through to two years after I officially retired, but when I stopped being paid, uh, let me look what I can't, it's 36 years. 36, wow. Yeah, and if you add on the connections I've had as, as a trustee and so on, it's longer, but I would say it's 36 years, which I know it's not so much an achievement as a kind of, I wonder whether some people these days, especially younger people, will think, God, didn't she ever want to do anything different? <laughs> and the answer is yes, quite often. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's something about mass observation in, in many ways, isn't it? That we've been lucky with, that even if we want to go and do other things, we still can get pulled back and it's a joy to work with regardless. So it's not sort of like, you know, it's that, and that's really wonderful. But what were you doing? You know, what did you first do when you had that interview with Tom Harrison? Well, of course, I had no idea when I started. Uh, it was more or less to be his dog's body. I, it wasn't a really proper interview at all. Um, HR would have a, <laughs> a collapse. I came into the room and he... He wasn't really terribly interested in me, but he wanted somebody who would act as a kind of dog's body and look after his stuff. And he wasn't actually um, based much at Sussex by that time. He was living in Brussels and commuting over maybe twice a term. So he wanted somebody there to open the post and communicate with him and also find material. So right, at, you know, from the collection for his research, he was working on living through the Blitz which came out in after he died in 76. So he would do things like um, phone up. And as everybody who's ever talked about him knows, he was a bit of a bully. I need to have some um, on the spot experiences of people being bombed in Liverpool. And I have to say, and I think one of your questions was, you know, when did you come across MO and mass observation? I knew nothing about mass observation, really, when I got the job. Everything I learned about it, I learned from sitting among the boxes. Um, How? That, what were you doing when you were sitting among the boxes? What was? Well, looking for first-hand accounts of bombing in Liverpool. Like right. <laughs> or <laughs> just enjoying myself. I mean, we didn't have very many users. Tom Harrison didn't want me to let anybody in anyway. He more or less employed me as a gatekeeper. Um, and so a lot of the time I just read the material and explored it. So probably that was something that no one else has ever had that much of a chance to do. But it was quite a good thing to do. It wasn't sorted. It was in sort of categories, but not really. And I kind of got to know it just by being with it, just by being close to it and reading very gradually because he was asking me things and then other people started to it became important to be able to find things so having and, not ever come across it before yeah you know opening that first box and looking for the account of bombing in Liverpool what what did you make of it what, what was your first impression of mass observation oh I was completely intrigued particularly with the diaries because I was I was still am 37 years later or whatever, more than that, um, a diary keeper myself and had been 
I suppose I was in my early 20s and I'd kept a diary for quite a few years. And so I was completely riveted and it changed my own diary writing for a while because I felt that I wasn't doing enough of the social record. Mine was much too personal and reflective. And when I saw these people writing about everyday life, in the 1930s and 40s, I thought, oh dear, I ought to improve my style. And for a while I made an effort to actually write a more socially aware diary, but it didn't last. <laughs> it, it isn't really a day diary. I mean, they were instructed to keep a record of what they did and felt and saw. Whereas a lot of people write diaries just for their feelings and mm. effect. And mind you, I think some of the best diaries are people who manage to combine both. And I suppose those were the diaries I was drawn to. So I did have quite a good idea about Nella Last long before the book came out and Naomi Mitchison long before we edited that for publication. Um, but it was hard to get a sense of individual people because of the way that the original mass observers and Tom Harrison had stored the material in monthly boxes. Mm. So if you wanted to follow somebody through over many years, you had to be pretty good at lugging boxes off the shelf and finding them mm. in the boxes. Mm. Um, um, I learned that much later, I, I learned that the hard way, I learned how difficult the way the diaries were organized because I did a, I think it was well before your time, a diary workshop, adult ed class. Okay. And I thought one way of finding out who the diarists were would be to uh, ask all the students that signed up for the course to, to adopt a diary writer and read them through um, and build up a picture of one person. Mm. So all, all these students, well, they were students of all sorts of ages, adult students, picked somebody to follow through. But the problem was they weren't allowed to go into the store or the basement of, of the archive. So before the class, I had to spend about two hours lugging loads and loads of boxes onto, onto trolleys. <laughs> I thought there was less teaching and more physical exertion involved in that. But it was a, an interesting course because the students became completely identified with the diary writer they chose and were quite competitive about them <laughs> so it's interesting that you you presume you were using the older material for teaching so you did significant amounts of teaching yes. um also you sorted a lot of the older archive as well didn't you yeah. so you yeah. went through um but in terms of the um you know having sorted it having taught with it and everything you then developed the mass observation project and essentially became its, you know, face for many years, the sort of the driver behind Mass Observation Project. Um, so yeah. tell me, when, yeah. When, yeah, when you're talking about the, the sort of the, the way that you became interested in keeping your own diary, did that change when you started to get different kinds of writing from contemporaries coming through? Did you identify with them more or less? Or? I think probably like everybody who opens a box and reads things, I had my favourites. Right. Or I had people that I, or they were, or not necessarily favourites, people I didn't like but found really interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it really changed in the end, in the long term, I don't think it changed how I wrote because, and, and that's, that was a learning thing for me too, because I don't think it's very easy to change the way people write if they found a method they like. Um, and I think a lot of the people who write for mass observation have their own style, their own way, their own interpretation of what being a mass observer is. Mm. And although it, although they're very similar to each other, I think they have quite strong views about what's acceptable to write about, what they want to write about, and also who they're writing for. They have a very fixed idea. And I thought, for example, when my colleague David Pocock left and, and they thought they'd all been writing to this professor of anthropology, and I thought they'll all stop writing now because he's left. 
They didn't because they all liked writing. And I think that's what happens. People get decided on how they're going to be. And if there are changes, it's more to do with them and their age or their situation. Um, but they all develop their own perception of what it, of what it means to be a mass observer. I've always thought that was really interesting when I went through a lot of those earlier boxes, the amount of times I found letters essentially that they were writing to you, you know, so it's to yeah. dear Dorothy or yeah. dear, and, and, and that wonderful kind of concept of what an archive is um, and that, that you and, and I suppose now my colleagues on the mass observation team are, are identified as the archive, you know, that there's yeah. that conversation, which is really unique, I think. Um, but if I, you know, wh where has it taken you? Where has it taken you? What you know, people that you've met, things you've done, places you've been that you might not have expected to go to in 1976, when you're 1974, when you, you kind of had that interview with um, Tom Harrison? I suppose the very first thing was meeting him. I hadn't <laughs> heard of him before, but um, in terms of changing my life, because I think you, you did ask one question when in your written thing about did anything change your life? And all I could think of was the day I met Tom Harris. <laughs> I had no idea. You know, I thought, oh, I'll do a bit of temporary work for this old codger. <laughs> um, it fits in because my little boy was little. Um, and I had a place at the nursery at the university. I thought, I'll do this for a bit. It's interesting. Um, but then it really did seduce me because, first of all, there were many people still around who had been mass observers in the 1930s and 40s who were very varied and very interesting. Many of them were poets, writers, artists, photographers, Humphrey Spender, for instance. Mm. They were really interesting. They were pretty getting on in age in the 70s and 80s. But I felt it was a real privilege to meet them. Mm. Um, Julian Trevelyan I met and um, Humphrey Spender was one of the loveliest people. Um, and of course, Naomi Mitchison, who lived to 101, I think. And um, so it was those people that had been involved in the creation of the collection mm -hmm. and the development of the ideas of mass observation. Um, and then the people who used it were interesting, the people who got in touch about it, filmmakers, radio producers. I mean, Richard Broad, who ended up editing uh, Nella Last War, mm -hmm. a, a producer, a director, for Thames Television and he'd done some really big series before he found us and decided he was interested in Nella. Um, and with David Pocock too, I went to places like, we went, we were invited up to the offices of the Daily Mirror and met the editor of the Daily Mirror. I just thought, I, without mass observation, I'd have never seen inside a national newspaper office. Yeah, um, wow. Um, and in your question, you said Queenie, for example, and I suppose that it was through mass observation that I actually did meet the Queen and when I went up to collect my MBE. And that, even though I am a Republican and it <laughs> with all sorts of uh, reservations, I thought, well, I've worked really hard for the mass observation archive. It's beginning to gather momentum. I'll accept it on behalf of me and the people that have worked so hard to pre preserve it and to help it survive. So, uh, yes, I did shake her hand. I can't remember now what she said to me, but I know that the MBE was for services to anthropology, which I was <laughs> sure about, but anyway. <laughs> That's interesting because I was going to ask actually, I don't think in all the years we've known each other, I've ever asked you what it was for. You know, I assumed it was around mass observation, but what the actual technical giving was for but yeah services to anthropology well there you go and I mean I'd done a degree in sociology and another one in history so it, I thought oh well this is anthropology <laughs> and mass observation being so uh multidisciplinary that was quite nice really lovely I think that, that that's really lovely um 
Um, and, and also, I mean, you mentioned Naomi Mitchison earlier, and obviously you worked closely with her in, in editing her diary um, and, and have written other books subsequently since. So again, was that something that you would have thought you would be doing when you first went into that office and met Tom Harrison? No, I hadn't. I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and that's almost an embarrassment now, but in the 19... 60s and 70s you didn't really have to I was a real real product I hate to say it I was a real product of Sussex mm -hmm. I came to do I came to Sussex because of its interdisciplinarity and because of the variety of its courses and the uh, innovative way that it taught and in a way I was privileged at that time to be able to just I chose courses because I was interested in them and hadn't really thought of a career beyond I think I started getting interested in nursing towards the end of it uh, and working with old people so you could say <laughs> I and I, I was very interested in old people and in the psychology of aging even when I was quite young myself and maybe that's what clicked in but I hadn't really decided what I wanted to do once I started working in the archive I started to think about a professional qualification in archiving and at that time it was really quite difficult there were no um, remote courses you know online courses or anything like that and they all seemed to be devoted to or dominated by local government kinds of issues and nothing seemed to apply to modern modern record collections mm. and in any case I would have had to have traveled to London two or three times a week and my job at Sussex was much too temporary and insecure to support that and so my son was much too small as well I think mm. so I gave up on the idea of I don't regret it but I do think now the courses are much better and um, yeah. there's probably much more scope. And I'm very glad to hear, you know, that Jessica and so on, other people have been able to do I it. To do it. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, so I asked you uh, when, when we were you know, talking about what kind of things we would talk about to imagine that I've cast you onto your desert island and you've only got one or two documents to bring with you, what would you bring with you? That's a hard question and a bit mean, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so big, isn't it? Um, I would, when I was trying to write an answer to this, I wrote that I would like the diaries, but they're, <laughs> that would sink any raft if you tried to bring them. Oh, well, it's fine, because Jessica brought the entire National Lesbian and Gay Survey with her. <laughs> <laughs> so there'll be plenty to read. So when you say the diaries, you mean the uh, the early period of diaries? I do. Period I, you... I, hmm, I do, but I think that I, I read more of them, and I'm more familiar with them. Oh, I've forgotten a lot, but than I was with some of the diaries that were sent to us more recently and the collections of letters. So it's possible that I might be better off with the post-1980 personal writing collection because I didn't spend a lot of time on them. Mm. And, and there's one writer who I enjoyed at the time who I think I would love to reread and and he was the he was the the guy who wrote from prison, right? You know, and I I know he's quite well known now, and um, and often writes about prison life and criminology and so on. But I used to think his his accounts of life in prison were both shocking and revealing. And he and he he kind of shifted the balance because it always preoccupied me this feeling that we were observing or we were the researchers and they were the research. And I wanted to shake that relationship so it wasn't quite so dichotomous. And I think he was one of the people that helped me see it differently because he used to say that he was writing to educate me because yeah. we lived in an ivory tower at a university. 
And I think he was right in some ways, in some ways. We cut off from particular worlds, which is a world I've discovered more since I've retired, and which I don't, and I don't regret being in. A, I'm very glad to have been in a university, but uh, I think I think he's right. The worlds out there are very big, and it would be his diary, I think, and his his contributions that I would take to read properly. And that that's very much sort of going back to the original you know founding ethos I suppose of mass observation that idea of going out and listening to voices that wouldn't normally be heard yeah be yeah. Easy yeah yeah um, yeah so I was wondering you know you sort of got your your raft of of wartime diaries and and also I'll let you have this additional one as well um but what about your sort of your memories from Massovs. I know that you've spoken um, about the life changing moment of meeting Tom Harrison and getting the role there, but are there any things that you hold really dear, either events or you know, places that you've been that are mass observation -y? Although I have mixed feelings, you know, it was a bit scary. I, I'm very pleased that mass observation took me to places I might not have gone to. Um, I mean, America, I, I probably would have gone to America, but but I, in the course of mass observation work, I went and we did, we did talks at places like Harvard. I don't suppose I'd have ever been to Harvard if it hadn't been for mass observation. Um, France, Germany, Eastern Europe, I think that was very interesting. And I went to Eastern Europe after the Berlin Wall had fallen in order to talk to women researchers about recording women through the transition, about using mass observation style methods for getting women to record their lives and to talk about the pros and cons. You know, that women lost some things after the fall of communism. They lost things like nursery places and they gained other things. But that, that transitional period was very interesting for people to record. And I enjoyed meeting some of the researchers, mostly women researchers in, uh, well, it was in Ber East Berlin, or what was formerly East Berlin, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland. That was a real privilege, um, I suppose, but you know, Going to Bolton for me was a big thrill because I'd only ever read things about Mo Bolton in 1937 and 38. And I didn't really, I mean, I more or less thought it was in black and white. And, that, <laughs> and I say that as a northerner because I came from Yorkshire. But when I went to Bolton and met the people there, it was really wonderful and a nice privilege and interesting. And, and what would you know, but in the talk that I gave, about mass observation, there was a current mass observer at the back of the hall mm. observing me. <laughs> <laughs> and did you first read about that? In the uh, I, he wrote to me afterwards and said, not bad, Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> at the back of the hall. I thought that's, you know, that's that kind of circularity, that kind of feeling that um, we're all part of something. Yeah. I mean, I never got, I never went as far as the man who wrote and said perhaps mass observers could have a special tie. <laughs> rather male chauvinist about that. <laughs> um, that sense of identity with a project, which I think the people who wrote shared with us at that time. Um, and even, you know, they may have had it in the 1930s and 40s, but we re-engendered re it. I mean, it seemed to grow again in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Very much Those so. people feel that they're special and they are special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's really come through again with things like the um, collections that we have made during COVID, for example, people, people wanting to be part of a movement that records a very particular event as yeah. well, which yeah. um, is, is fascinating. Um, and I, I'm also really taken with what you were saying about your experiences in Eastern Europe as well, because I think that's what I've found very sobering is um, when people kind of invite you to talk about how to do this, that and the other. And I go along and I start with my normal conversation of in 1937, three young men. 
And then you realize that the people that you're talking to are actually needing this because they've never had that opportunity to record yeah. in the same way. Yeah. And, and it's not a, a luxurious thing to do. It's something about creating a history. And I think that's, that, that's so powerful. Um, but going back to um, favorite themes, I suppose, obviously you launched with Dave Pocock, you launched the Mass Observation Project um, and you worked on it for many, many years. I'm trying to think now, I know that we celebrated your 30th anniversary in the archive, um, but I'm not sure if it was necessarily 30 years of mass observation. I think you may have just missed 30 years of working on a mass observation project yeah. Yeah. Um, before you retired. And in that time, what was your favorite theme that we asked about? Well, I think the one that I felt was most revealing and which um, I was most touched by how open people were was one that I hesitated before I, I set it, but it was the one on uh, menstruation. Right. It, uh, even now, but then it seemed an absolutely taboo subject. Mm. I don't remember what year it was. I mean, it was the 90s, I'm sure. Mm. I, I think it was the 90s, but people thought I shouldn't or you know it would it might it might stop people writing or it was intrusive people were worried about it being intrusive but I was really aware that there was very little uh, research material and certainly none from the point of view of um, the women mm -hmm. and men I wanted to hear what men thought too but women's experience and it turned out I never wrote, wrote it up or read it through, but it turned out when I read it that it revealed a huge amount of information, not just about the direct thoughts on menstruation, but on the clothes women wore, the income they had and what they had to spend on sanitary protection, how it, that had changed. Because of course, what you have with mass observation is the here and now, and then the lifetime of that person. So if somebody is 60, when they're writing in you know, 1980, it goes back a long way. Um, also the relationships between mothers and daughters, good and bad, mm. and, other, and sisters, and grandmothers so you know if if somebody were going to come to the archive who said i'm looking at women's relationships with each other mm. i'd say well rather than just ask them directly what are your relationships why don't you look at what comes out mm. of it's that indirect way of looking at things that you get as you know as you you can get really a lot of information mm. and i was also very touched that people uh didn't write and say how dare you you intrusive person and this isn't they did write apart from one man and I don't know if you've ever seen his but he wrote and said this is such a trivial subject you should be asking people about the European community <laughs> okay <laughs> that put me in my place I, I I was often put in my place by the writers themselves uh, particularly some of the men you know I remember when I did the one called uh, women and men and I deliberately just you know turned around and one man wrote and he said, I can see what you think I know where you're coming from you know but it's not women and men it's men and women it's eggs and bacon it's cut you know it's cut and saucer it's like these were fixed things and I suppose one of the things I enjoyed about it as a research methodology was using the directives as a way of provoking people which many social researchers might see as leading or uh, provocative or too dialogic but I find that it opens up people and gets them going and that's really what we want isn't it very much so and that's the thing about mass observers isn't it is that they will write about what they want to write about yeah. Um, and as a result, you do get the most, the richest um, material that you don't expect. Yeah. So you're certainly not leading yeah. them. <laughs> and I think the silences... You don't need leading. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I think the silences are often really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And on that note, um, is there a, a theme or a subject that you wish you had asked about that you didn't ask about? I wish that we'd asked more about the political situation in the 80s. 
uh, people's feelings about the miners' strike, only because I felt sorry when people came and asked about asked to do research on right. it, that we seem to have an awful lot on that was when David was really David Pocock was really deciding on the themes mm -hmm. he was very anxious about anything that might appear controversial okay I mean even the Falklands war he was very came at it sideways um so I'm sorry that we didn't do that. I'm sorry that we didn't ask about the miners' strike or some of the industrial disputes at a time when, in the 80s, when the trade unions were diminishing in power. And mm -hmm. that was very significant time during Thatcherism. It doesn't mean to say that it's not there, of course, because people mm -hmm. will write and you can read between the lines. As for anything, any one theme since, I tried to think of that and then I thought, look Sheridan you had something like 200 opportunities <laughs> to pick your own subject it's other people's turn now. Uh, I, I don't think the, the only thing I'm interested in now is I'm quite interested in the ways in which there's been this outpouring of generosity about Ukraine uh, and about refugees mm. and yet to me because I've been working with refugees from Syria and from Afghanistan and from Egypt and Iran and Iraq. I kind of wonder how people are squaring that in their minds, mm -hmm. because there's been such hostility to, and some of the people that I meet who are not Ukrainians, but who've come before that, mm -hmm. have such a harsh life. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm interested in what's going on in the, public mind that means that some refugees are more deserving than others and I hope it's not racism but it but it does feel a bit like you help people if they're more like you um, and I suppose if I was still doing the job I was doing before or you're doing I might say right let's do refugees yeah and I might be quite provocative because I think there's a kind of public um I, what, what's the word it's assumed that we are all on board with you know putting up blue and yellow flags and 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 of course it's horrendous what's happening they're just awful oh and I should say that I went to Ukraine as part of uh, mass observation and actually helped people doing um life story work I went with Robert Perks who is doing oral history to talk to people about doing life story work in Ukraine. So I do know, and I, I was in Lviv and Kiev, and I do know how dreadful it must be, but those thoughts come in my mind. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm still wanting to be provocative. Yeah. Yeah. You're not alone there. And, um, and I think that would be a really interesting one to ask about. And I think what's so great about mass observation is that you could ask it and really get under the skin of it. Yeah. Um, with those two or three pro provocative questions yeah and, uh, you yeah. know and I think that's yeah. the powerful thing about mass observation yeah um yeah. which makes it important so I'm going to say to you Dorothy why why are archives and projects like mass observation important why have countries come to us in the past and projects and asked to find out how we do it what why well one rather cheap reply is it's rather cheap as a method, <laughs> a method of social research. I wasn't expecting that but that's so true <laughs> but it means that people who don't have a lot of money um I mean it, it, in a way going back to the original mass observation idea of a democratic democratic social science mm. and it was one of the things that I talked to women about in eastern Europe you don't actually, you do need to have an archive and you do need to look after it. But at the beginning anyway, you can collect or ask people to contribute. And you do, you know, there isn't a huge amount of resource needed to reach hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm. So compared to say oral history, which is relatively speaking more expensive by the time you've done the transcripts and you've done, you've and play, paid your interviewers and so on, it's mm. quite expensive. And it, yet it reaches a huge number of people. I think it's that it gives, that it encourages people, obviously only some people, people who like writing 
or communicating, because I realise that there are other forms of technology involved, to say something about their own lives in their own words. Mm -hmm. And however much the media is, you know, popular or people get on television or I feel like this is a public, a lovely combination of public and private. Mm. People can write or speak into something that when they're on their own, reflect on things mm. and know that it's going to be looked after. I mean, I think that's important that it will last. And I think that's very important for people's motivation to know it's going to be looked after and I think the one uh, the other thing is the longitudinal nature of it mm. and I think although when the original mass observers were doing it to document the second world war and they put everything in monthly batches and they tended to look at it rather segmented nevertheless the real value has been for many researchers to follow through individual people, to look at how people change in relation to the wider historic mm. changes in the world. And I know, for instance, that um, observing the 80s followed people through. Mm. And I think that allows you, for the researcher, access to really unparalleled opportunities to think about the way people navigate their environment and the context they live in. And we don't often have that. I mean, we get a lot of that are just sort of asking people for a moment in time how they feel. But this allows you to see how people evolve as they get older as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I hope. <laughs> I think it does. I think it does. And it's certainly one of the, the parts of my research that I've enjoyed the most is piecing those those bits of writing together and, and watching people evolve yeah. um, and I think there's something that we can all um, we can find ourselves in that as well you know reading yeah. somebody else's reflections causes you to reflect yeah um, yeah yeah so mass observation celebrates 85 years this year and 40 years of uh, sorry 40 years of the mass observation project this year and 85 years of uh, mass observation altogether next year. So we're having this wonderful year of celebrations of which this is part. I'm going to ask the inevitable question, Dorothy. I want you to get your crystal ball out. And, and do you think mass observation is still going to be going in another 85 years? It really is difficult, isn't it? I mean, I don't mean to be depressive, but I just hope we are all going in 85 years. <laughs> But if we are, and I hope we will be, um, I hope that whatever way we do it, whatever writing or um, communication technology that we use, there will still be a place not just for recording how we're feeling about living, but that there'll be somebody, the mass observation, who will look after it and make it available because it's, it's a dialogue, I think. It's a dialogue with the future. Um, we think of it as a dialogue with the past because we're always looking at what's already been written. But in many ways, the people that write are writing for future historians. So I'd like to think that rolling conversation would go on. Whatever method of um, recording that's used and and in fact using every method of recording I mean one of the wonderful things about mass observation is it's been able to take advantage of the developments in technology I mean it takes my breath away things I never thought I'd see in my lifetime like being able to um, digitize handwriting different mm. handwriting I mean I can remember thinking about it. I, I, I think when you first started with me and we talked about it, you yeah. know, it seemed like that would be a step too far. The fact that you could just about manage 1940s typing. <laughs> you, did, didn't it? You, you managed to uh, digitize that. It struggled a bit, but we did get the, some of the yeah. files. for the future um, and that it gives you a better capacity to find things as well that is 
uh, the search method, the search methods have become so much more refined so that you, you know, I wouldn't be sitting there wondering if the box at the top of the shelf had something about Liverpool during the heavy bombing. I'd simply go to my computer and type it in. <laughs> <laughs> I have Why? to ask you, Dorothy, did you ever find about anything about Liverpool and the heavy bombing? Yes, I think I did. I think Good. I did. I think I don't think I was credited with anything by Harrison in his book, Living Through the Blitz. But I think some of the quotes were probably ones that I had sweated over, then typed out really painfully and sent. Them. Well, um, what I will say is that I think you may not have been credited for those particular quotes being typed out. But, you know, we owe a huge debt. Mass observation owes a huge debt to all of the work and the dedication and the joy that you brought to it over the years as well. So um, Dorothy, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I suppose we should leave wishing Mass Observation very happy 85th birthday. Good, yes, happy birthday. And, and I in turn want to say how wonderfully you've done because there's been a lot of continuity. I know you've had people come and go, but I was there a long time. You've been there a long time. Jessica's been there a long yep. time. And Jane's been around looking after us for a long time. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, I think we worked out that the current team, we amassed something like 65 years <laughs> between us. Um, really? and, and that service, not age, sadly. But uh, yeah, so it's there is something about mass observation which does keep people close to it, yes. uh, be they writers or workers or researchers. So, so thank you for enabling that all the, these many years. It thank was you. fun. It was fun. <laughs>